just so you know, the encampment participation is required for getting your Mitchell Award. Carry on video. I just want to say that this is about encampment, so I would like to hear your stories. I mentioned this at the end of the video too, but please, if you are interested in sharing some of your experiences or interesting uh, fun facts about your wings encampment, I would love to hear them in the comments down below. So let's go ahead into the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Wheel here, and welcome to another Civil Air Patrol video. Now in today's video, I'm going to be talking about encampment. If you're not familiar with what encampment is, this is just an introductory video that kind of tells you about the different aspects of Civil Air Patrol's encampment listed out in something called the CAP Pamphlet 60-70 and talk a little bit about the experience of what a student goes through, which is like the first year attendee of the activity. If you already know what encampment is, it's possible that your wing does the cap pamphlet 60-70 a little bit differently from what I'm talking about, so hopefully this will be useful for you if you're an experienced Civil Air Patrol member already. But without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Hey guys, so something really quickly I wanted to mention was that you were required to attend at least 80% of encampment before you can receive credit for attending, so that's just something to keep in mind to receive full credit. I know sometimes people have reasons to leave early, but you're required to at least attend 80% before you get credit. So the CAP pamphlet 60-70 has a lot of great information in it, and if you're not really sure what encampment is, it's a somewhat longish activity depending on what type it is. If it's a type A encampment, then it's about seven to nine days long, and if it's a type B, then it's typically over the course of two weekends. Most are type A, so you should expect that it's about a week-ish long, a little bit longer maybe, and it's an opportunity to get fully immersed in cadet life, learn about aerospace and cyber-related careers, kind of like get into the mindset of living a healthy lifestyle, and developing all of those wonderful leadership skills. And of course, this is what the the mission statement is, and then the, the vision statement is just like a full immersion into all of the aspects of cadet life. So it's pretty cool. I personally have participated in five um, from being a student. We used to be called basics, but basic is not proper terminology anymore. They're referred to as student. Um, I attended as a student back in 2011, and I, I served as a cadet training wing commander because we had a whole wing. Um, typically, it's a cadet training group commander, and it, it depends on how big the encampment is, but um, sometimes, like, you'll have... The, like the lowest level is flight, then squadron, then uh, group, then sometimes wing. And we had a wing when I was cadet commander, which was really cool. We had 234 students, which was really amazing. And 100 cadet staff members, and we, we called them cadre. Um, a cadre member is, well, a cadre is defined as like a specialized trained individual. And we, we gave specialized training to the cadre ahead of time with like what the expectations were for using intensity, what they were going to be doing, how they could put together pocket classes to do classes on the go with their students, what they should expect for their schedule, generally speaking, and give them a chance to learn a lot of leadership skills in terms of like communicating over teleconferences and preparing for like six-ish months before leading up to the actual activity. So um, when I was selected, it was nine months before the actual encampment happened, and I had the chance to put together the whole cadet selection, or the cadet staff selection process, and move through the entire process up until the actual activity. Um, again, the size of the encampment depends on how many students and how many cadet staff members can get involved. Also, how many senior members can get involved, because there is a lot of senior member support in addition to the cadet side that is needed in order to effectively carry out the activity. So if you don't have that many senior members, then typically it's going to be a little bit smaller. And if you have a lot of senior members and a lot of cadets, then, and the facilities that can take care of it, then it can be a bit larger. I know quite a few encampments were canceled this year, and I'm very sorry if you had signed up and you couldn't attend because I thought encampment was a fantastic experience, under like the new pamphlet, but the old pamphlet and like the old guidance was like barely existent and it was just kind of like all over the place. But CAP 
or excuse me, the CAP pamphlet 60-70 is supposed to standardize the practices that are done at encampments and kind of give all of the wings a chance to have something that's similar in order to make sure that if if someone has graduated an encampment, then I can have the expectation that, okay, so you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this. And like generally speaking, you understand different aerospace related careers. Generally speaking, you understand the aspects of living a healthy lifestyle. All of that kind of information is what I would expect of someone who has graduated in Camden, right? So it's just kind of to standardize students throughout the wing with what our expectations are and so that they can distribute those skills and that information to their own home units. I turned more lights on, so we'll see how that goes. But <laughs> here we are. We're back talking about encampment. Here is typically the process for, for getting into encampment. Typically, a, a few months before encampment, maybe three months before encampment, they will send out an announcement that the student registration is now open. And the first step is registering as a student to attend. So if you're attending as a student, then you have to turn in certain paperwork and you have to receive commander approval in order to attend the activity. The reason for that is because it is an outside of squadron activity and it's also an overnight. So you want to make sure that your commander knows that you're going to said activity, first of all. And second of all, it's just to be transparent with like communication between you, squadron commander and the encampment. Just, just so that everyone knows this is someone who is planning on attending the activity. Depending on the encampment, some of them can get full very, very quickly. So if you are planning on attending, then I recommend saving the dates for the encampment as a student and being like, okay, so it's happening from this day to this day and try to block those days off in the summer and don't schedule things on top of it because they aren't, they aren't really flexible with registration. If, if you haven't registered on time and there's a wait list, then there's a chance you may not make it on. But if, if it's a short wait list, then you might, depending on if people cancel or not. So just go ahead, register when you can, and try to get in there for a fun and exciting time at encampment. So after registering, you should receive confirmation from the admin or the administrative personnel with encampment saying, okay, your paperwork has been received, you're good to go, and we'll send out information along the way. Things that might be sent out are like a pack list, um, information about the activity, um, maybe updates and announcements about like the status or just like information in general. Um, some encampments, they have their flight cadre reach out to the students that are assigned to their flights ahead of time, like, like the week before and saying, hey, welcome, you're in my flight. Just wanted to let you know that you should pre be prepared to do this, this, and this, and we're very excited to have you. Um, sometimes the admin personnel they, they just send that out themselves. So it depending on what your wing does will will determine how that goes. But I personally like to know who my leadership is beforehand, even if it's just like a little intro email, just saying, hello, I will be in charge of you for a week and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Um, some, some people may view that as being too nice or the cadre members are supposed to be unknown beforehand. But I think being approachable and being relatable before someone meets you can actually help establish that positive respect, that two-way respect um, between people. But that's that's just my quick thought. But um, so you should you should expect to receive additional information on what you need for encampment and how the check-in process works with your wing ahead of time. So if there's like a specific location that you need to be dropped off at, or if it's on a base, how to get onto the base. That information will be sent out and sometimes they need a copy of like who is going on to base and like driver's license information but uh, it, it does vary so make sure you follow those instructions when they are sent out and don't be late to responding to admin requests that's another big thing so just keep that in mind um, so after you arrive there is a whole check-in process and there are items sometimes that are considered contraband or they, they are always considered contraband, I should say. So you're not supposed to really have electronics when you're at encampment, like um, having a tablet to play on all day or a laptop. Um, I think some, some encampments like to have the ability for the advanced students to have electronics to like be able to type up papers and stuff. 
but most student experiences they're not really using electronics typically because of how hands-on everything is and they don't really need it um so there, there's that and there's also energy drinks those are prohibited in general for people and you are not allowed to share medications um don't don't bring a surgical kit uh that's that's something that was found once when i was a uh, first sergeant they were like ah surgical kit with all of the the scalper scalpels and everything and i was like why you don't need that and they're like oh but i can do first aid with this and i was like no that's not it in terms of being checked for contraband that is done only by senior members. Cadets are not allowed to be doing that, and it should be in the presence of the parents just so that they can take the contraband back home with them rather than the contraband just sitting with encampment and then potentially not going home with them. So if possible, I recommend doing that. If, if you are familiar with the encampment process and you have control over it, have the parents stay and they will do the contraband check and while the students are being taken to their barracks after signing in to like drop their stuff off um the, the parents will go to a briefing typically with the encampment commander that talks a little bit about what the days are like the the schedule a little bit like how you do pt in the morning you eat breakfast you go do your activities you have lunch sometimes in the field sometimes in the chow hall you do more activities sometimes you do a fun evening activity take a shower you get uh, personal time and then you go to bed then they get the full rundown on the day they talk about like the two deep leadership rule where there will always be two senior members present in all of the areas that they are going to all that kind of information will be shared in the parents briefing while the students are off doing their thing training may not start until the honor agreement is signed with the students so intensity may not be raised until after that point and typically i i tell people who are going to be cadre that i would set the expectations first and be serious but not overly intense on the first day and ensure that they understand what the expectations are so in the barracks there's typically a bunk some kind of foot locker and sometimes a wall locker and the foot locker is kind of like a little chest thing that you have where you store your stuff um, the wall locker is where you can put your hanging items and the bunk is where you sleep. There's typically a way that you're supposed to do all of that. And expectations and standards should be shared on that first day when talking to the students. Um, additionally, the cadre members should be taking the students around the encampment area to just show like, hey, this is the chow hall. This is our barracks. This is where the first aid is. And this is where the command staff are. And that just gives them a chance to be oriented with where they are before getting into things. The first day of encampment can be a little bit overwhelming. I will admit, even for, for cadet staff members, it can be a little intimidating because it's like, I'm really excited, I'm, I really want to get this done, I want to go do it. And then over the course of the week, they, they kind of relax a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I think... As long as you take a deep breath, just relax, and know that you can do it, you can get through it, that, that's probably the best way to approach it and be like, this might be overwhelming now, but I know I can get through this, and I've got people who care about me, because the cadet staff, the senior members, they're all there to support you. They're there to support the students, because... That's the reason for the activity. It's for cadet leadership training and development. And it also trains and develops senior members too. It's just a leadership laboratory and that's why I love it so much. But it's, it's a way for cadet staff members to learn skills and implement them like on a consistent basis throughout the week. In addition to students like learning standards and understanding what they need to do while also getting to meet people from across the wing, sometimes even the region. So that's how the first day should go the about like that typically there's also like an evening formation where uh, well the entire encampment kind of lines up in their line formation and they're told to go to bed <laughs> and then it's it's a fun time where everyone just kind of goes to the barracks and goes to sleep in the morning typically cadets should be woken up and given several minutes to wake up I have seen from videos and from personal experience from several years ago 
that cadet staff sometimes turn on the lights, start screaming, banging trash can lids against walls, and being like, get up, cadets! I don't believe in yelling. And the night before, what I would rather do is I would tell like two cadets who are like interim element leaders almost to say, hey, at this time, you need to wake up. And we will turn the lights on. At that time, you have five minutes to get outside. Depending on the encampment, some encampments allow for the wearing of watches. I don't see a problem with wearing a watch. In fact, I think time management skills are very important. So if I entrust those like two or three cadets, then I say, this is your deadline. You need to get them outside in five minutes. All of their canteens slash camelbacks, depending on what you have, probably canteens. Your canteens need to be full. You need to wear your reflective belts and everyone has to be outside and ready in five minutes. And just the sheer intensity of me telling them that and telling everyone the expectation that they need to listen and they need to get out in five minutes with all of these things done and ready, then that sets the precedent that I have this expectation and you're being held to it. So typically I tell them the night before, like this is what the expectations are. And then they could probably just like put together all of their things the night before, which is a smart thing to do. And then they'll be ready for PT the following morning. How about that? That's what, what a concept. It's just giving people time to prepare rather than just like screaming at them. Some encampments are old fashioned. They, they do the, the trash can lids banging together. If you are going to be a future cadet staff member or if you currently are, challenge your cadets in ways that they may not expect. Like telling them to get outside in five minutes and then not saying a single word to them. And just standing and waiting. Just the sheer presence of you standing there and waiting patiently and then looking at your watch when they're done and saying, did you meet my standards? Did you meet my expectations? That will get into their minds that they expect, they are expected to be timely. So um, that's, that's just something that I wanted to put out there. But after waking up, you move into PT typically where you will do healthy fitness activities. So this can be a broad range from just doing your normal like jumping jacks to stretches to push-ups, flutter kicks, curl-ups, and sometimes the flight sergeants and first sergeants get a little creative. So maybe doing bear crawls or team building activities with the PT. They're typically in charge of planning out how that block works. So that's kind of like a way that the NCOs of encampment are empowered because they get to lead PT and like call out cadences and stuff. So, so that's, that's pretty fun. And after doing PT, typically it's shower time. So after showers, showers, um, they aren't allowed to be rushed through and timed and whistled at. Um, that, that's something else that used to happen at encampments and I'm not sure if it's happening anymore, but when I, when I was student, little student Weo, they, they would scream at us in the showers. And we were in World War II barracks. And little 12 year old me was like, I am very overwhelmed. And there was someone in my flight that year who did not fully shower because they just, they didn't know how to get themselves clean in 20 seconds. And of course, I was like, hoo, 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 and the water was freezing cold, and I was just like, oh my gosh. But I'm not saying that cadet staff can't say, you have a few minutes, take the time, get clean, get out, you're done. Um, they, they can manage the time and say, hey, cadet, you've been in there for a long time, please move along so that we can have other cadets shower. Like that, that is fine. But don't just scream at people, it's personal time. People are supposed to get clean during this time. You don't want them to stink. No stinky. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Then we move into breakfast. Some encampments have catered food come in. And some of them do a um, dining staff. Um, where they, they have cadets and senior members put together the food and it's typically cheaper that way. So if you're doing catered food, I recommend getting a dining services staff team because it's a good training opportunity for people to learn uh, how, how interesting experiences happen in the kitchen in addition to getting that service in for encampment without having to be 
in the direct spotlight on the operations side. Like the the dining services team, I would argue, is one of the most important teams and one of the the least recognized teams. So I think if you're interested in cadet staff, that's that's a great opportunity because you get to learn to work with the team while also facing interesting hours in the day, like sometimes waking up at five in the morning to make food that will be served at seven. But it's just, it's a very interesting process and you could always find out more with your wing by asking for more information from people in your wing. And right before breakfast, they typically have formation and they'll say like who the honor flight is or the warrior flight, depending on if your wing actually does that, which is like the wing, or not the wing, the, the flight that's most improved and the one that performed um, with the most excellence during the, the previous day. And typically the first day that people arrive isn't considered a day, it's, it's done by full days. So um, that's something to, to look forward to and kind of like have interflight competition between everyone. And in addition to that, it's, it's just a fun opportunity to see the whole encampment and maybe like say some cadences and be loud and proud in front of everyone to impress them. So it's, it's a fun time. Anyway, so after breakfast, there are daily activities that are involved with the different mission areas of encampment. So one of the things you might do is orientation rides, whether it be in a military aircraft or whether it be in like one of the cap Cessnas you might have a chance to fly in an airplane or a helicopter. That's pretty cool. You get to learn about aerospace related careers and cyber related careers. So they'll typically have at least one guest speaker talk about cyber related stuff. And that might be a senior member, that might be someone who's not a senior member and they're just like coming to visit for part of the day and talk about their experience as a professional in cyber security. But um, the aerospace related careers also kind of goes into the orientation rides where you get to learn about being a pilot and there's there's something called the uh, the encampment handbook, which is a little book that you receive on the first day, or at least you should receive on the first day. Sometimes you receive an SOP2, which is standardized operating procedures, which are the expectations for students. But anyway, that book has information on aerospace related careers as well. Um, there's also different activities that kind of teach you leadership skills. So there are team leadership problems or team leadership challenges, either TLP or TLC, depending on who you are. And the leadership officer, or like the leadership officer of encampment and the cadet leadership officers do these different activities to kind of evaluate how the team is coming together, storming, norming, performing, and adjoining, right? Woo! Team life cycle. And like teach leadership skills to enhance students' leadership toolboxes through these different activities. Um, there's something called an air assault course. There, it's kind of like an obstacle course. Sometimes it's called a confidence course. Sometimes it's it's called just, well, obstacle courses. Uh, and they, they have different activities where you can try to like climb up a rope or these, these giant wooden things you have to climb over. Um, I got to use something called the confidence course and that one was more oriented towards the National Guard. There was barbed wire and it ripped through my BDU pants when we were wearing BDUs at the time. And it made me very sad because I had a hole in my BDUs for the remainder of the week. There's also something called the LRC or the Leadership Reaction Course, which the leadership officers kind of help put together and they sometimes are used to brief the cadets throughout the week. Um, that, that's always a lot of fun. Sometimes there's downtime, which you get to stay in the barracks and you get to work together with your team members to put together everything and meet standards like uh, making your bunks, cleaning the floors, cleaning the, the head or the bathroom. And it's, it's a good time because you, you can like get to meet your, your wingman and the other members in your flight in addition to reading your SOP or reading your encampment handbook. For inspections, you're typically supposed to be inspected by your flight sergeant and your flight commander, and so they'll check the standards because there's something that used to be called SET, which is the Standards and Evaluation Steam, that doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so the leadership team does not replace that. It's just used as a tool to talk about like giving feedback, teach classes, and give cadets the opportunity to serve as cadet staff in like being a mentor on leadership specifically for the cadet staff and for the students at encampment in addition to the senior member leadership officer. So um, the 
flight sergeant and flight commander can like track their progress throughout the week and say, this is the time that we're doing our flights inspections. You guys have this amount of time to finish, go. And by wearing their watches, they'll know how long they actually have. Cool, right? So I have listed most of the activities that you'll do throughout the day. And that's not all of them, but it's quite a few of them. And in the, the middle of the day, you will be given lunch. Sometimes you eat it at the chow hall. Sometimes you'll eat it on the go. Like if you're at a rappel tower in the middle of nowhere or like a 10 minute drive away from the barracks and the chow hall, then you most likely will not be driving back and forth for lunch unless it fits well into the schedule and you're gonna be doing stuff near the barracks anyway. So it, it just, it depends on how things are laid out where you are and what kind of facilities are available. Okay, so after you've done your afternoon activities, typically you'll start to feel tired. I challenge you to try to stay as awake as you can. And if there's a class, then work together with your wingmen to make sure no one falls asleep because falling asleep during classes is very disrespectful, but because of how much energy you're just using, how much time you're spending outside in comparison to how you usually are, you will you will probably be tired. And cadet staff get very, very tired because sometimes they don't get as much sleep as they need to. Um, speaking of sleep, students are required to get eight and a half hours of sleep and cadet staff are required to get eight hours of sleep. So this, this is required. This is required, okay? You don't just get to stay on your bunk and then start chatting with other people when it's like midnight. That's not the point. We need you to sleep, so please sleep when you need to. Like, we got rid of something called, what was it, CQ duty? Which is where you would just sit outside of your barracks, it would be like a pair of you. The two of you would sit outside, two students would sit outside, and they were like fire watch. Where they sit outside for an hour, and once that hour is up, they come back inside, they wake up the next pair, and they go outside. What are they doing? They watch. They look around, they sit for an hour, losing sleep, interrupting their circadian rhythms, and waking up exhausted the following day. So it's like, guys, no more CQ duty, okay? Okay, so after dinner, you typically have additional activities. Sometimes there are classes, but there's also sometimes like evening, team building, times where you get to do some kind of fitness activity like ultimate frisbee or um what is it freeze tag or volleyball and it's just supposed to be fun time where you get to hang out with the other cadets anyway i have i have stories for encampment which i will share maybe maybe someday but it is too early for that after doing those things there is something called personal time which is 30 uninterrupted minutes of time where the students get to relax and it is just time to shower and chill. Now that there is shower time beforehand and that they'll be given like 30 minutes for shower time and then 30 minutes for personal time. So if they want to study, that's cool. If they want to chat with other people, that's cool too. Um, it's up to the students as to what they do, but typically they, they might be shining shoes or hanging out during that time. And there is something called blister checks where the senior members will be checking feet to make sure there aren't huge blisters. I don't know how that will be done uh, with upcoming encampments, with, with COVID stuff, but typically at the end of the day, people have a lot of blisters. And so the senior members would help with like putting moleskin on so they'll cut it out and then the cadets can put it on their feet to prevent uh, future blistering and be prepared. So that, that happens after the showers. Then people get to go to sleep after the personal time. So then the, the cycle repeats with waking up, doing the things with the PT, getting showered, formation, breakfast, activities, lunch, activities, um, dinner, a few more activities, formation, personal time, bed. Okay, so that, that's just the, the general way that it goes. Um, throughout the week, you'll get to do something called feedback, where you get a feedback form and then the, the flight commander and flight sergeant give feedback on individual performance at the beginning of the week, 
and they sometimes have time for the middle of the week and then there's the end of the week and in addition to that they want feedback for the encampment itself which is called the encampment critiques which students will fill out on like the last day or second to last day and will be looked at by the encampment commander to kind of like put that after action review together of like what people actually thought because customer satisfaction in fact is very important with the encampment Oh, another quick thing that I didn't mention earlier is that the demerit and merit system has been prohibited from encampments, so you, you can't you can't write those things anymore. If if you're familiar with what those are, they, they've been phased out for a while, at least in my wing, but some wings I think still do it, so just, just be aware that merits and merits, merits and demerits are not supposed to exist anymore. So I think that's a pretty good overview of what encampment is. I know I talked a little bit about my personal experience, but hey, I would love to hear what your experiences are with encampment. So if you are interested in sharing, I would love to hear some of your encampment stories and highlights and interesting fun facts in the comments down below. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. And that is all folks until next time. Toodles.